Awesome. Okay. Cool. Um, yes, that's my Twitter handle, and that's the organization I work for, Obsidian Systems. Um, I don't know if you've heard of us. Quick thank you. I want to thank my team for being here. Thank you so much for coming. You're the best. Calvin Pledwell, thanks for coming. Lonnie, who's at home, keeping everything on the go and go. Bob, still not me. My wife, sorry I worked all weekend on this again. My, my mistake. Anyway, so, I use memes to describe things. I'm sorry if you've seen this talk before. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If some, some one person who was at DevOps days two weeks ago, I'm sorry. I use memes to describe things in IT. Why? Because this is the easiest way that we relate to things in the real world, right? So, business. Business, business, business. Your manager calls you, you're late for a meeting. It's business time. You go to this vendor's meeting and the guy says, listen, what if I tell you that you could have both speed and safety? You're like, what? It's crazy. The guy pitches this thing called DevOps. DevOps is going to solve all your problems. It's this new thing. Lots of vendors put it on their slides. They want to make a lot of money. It's just a line item. It's crazy. In your heart, you say yes. DevOps. In your, in your mind, it's like, oh my gosh, DevOps is coming. It's going to be totally amazing. Your manager is just a hard business, right? That's, that's it. Now, I don't know if you, any of you work for a manager. What do you pay yourself? I bought a printer. I print my own money at home. Maybe you're not that lucky. Um, uh, it's called counterfeiting, right? Back in the office, everybody in DevOps assemble, gather the team, let's do this. Let's do some magic, right? Your operations team is just thinking about VMs. <laughs> They don't know anything about continuous integration or things like that. And they're like, yeah, you get a VM, you get a VM, you get a VM. It's crazy. Right? And then some clown one says, like, yeah, he's going to make his own vSphere using HTML5 and, and DevOps. It's like, yeah, that's not going to work. So you hear about this thing about containers, and you say, like, yeah, in the future, everything is going to be Dockerized. You've heard the story before. You've heard people say that. I don't know. Who's heard the thing that Docker is going to change everything? Anybody heard this thing before? Raise your hand higher, damn it. It's not an AA meeting. Jeez. If I marginalized you or criticized you with that statement, I'm not sorry. Anyway, so Docker Compose up. I'm such a hacker, right? Yeah, you do this, now you're a hacker, right? Somebody finds out you did this, and then, yeah, I know Docker. It's mind blow. Your manager is amazing. You know Docker now, you know everything, right? Container sprawl happens, there's containers everywhere. And then you get that reaching point <laughs> where you just say like this and say Docker one more time, I'll blow your brains out. And then you hear you go to a vendor meeting and say, like, no, the next new thing is Kubernetes. It's so hot right now. Yeah. Then you deal with imposter syndrome, right? Because you don't know who you're supposed to be. And uh, you, know, you, you can't really pitch these solutions. You don't really know Docker. You don't really know these things. You're an ops guy. You just know what you know, right? Then they still want to ship production code, right? Don't know why people do this. I've never heard about this. It's never happened to me before, right? You tell them this and you don't, you don't simply test in production. It's ridiculous. You don't do that, right? You're thinking this, right? It's like, if I am the only one around here who doesn't think we should test the production, right? <laughs> doesn't think, right? Cool. And then some tester somewhere says, yeah, tonight we test the broad. I think, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never happens. Yeah, that's the best. Yeah, this is the compulsory slide. Everybody has this one. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> and then this is the epitome, the crowning achievement of everything. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's the best, right? And then you think to yourself, how the hell am I going to get out of this? How am I going to get rid of everything, right? So, yeah. I always question if I put a slide in from this guy. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to leave that alone. So, 
ultimately, the thing is in today's modern IT is that we have choices, right? Containers, VMs, static builds, AWS nodes, OpenStack nodes, Azure nodes, Google Compute. It's crazy, right? We, we, the choices are almost made for us because what people are expecting us to do. And it's, in today's, today's IT, we can't, we can't live with that, right? But choices is, is ultimately about free will. And free will is a little bit, <laughs> you make the choices and you make the recommendations. And everything is up to you on how you make those choices. You choose your own adventure. <laughs> yeah, just, sorry, the text wrapped there a bit crazy. So yeah, so ultimately this is about choosing your own adventure. Whatever technology you're gonna use is you're gonna have to choose your own adventure. And these choices is gonna bite you in the ass or maybe not, right? But it will, right? So you can choose your own adventure. It's fine. You, you can, you can you remember these books? They were so cool. You read and turn to a different page and then, yeah. But this is more the stuff that we're dealing with now. You can choose of 22 possible of endings of these choose your own adventure books. And this is ultimately it, right? You think this is how your modern infrastructure looks. It's a little bit there, a little bit there. Looks like my mom's. I think you might be listening. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, my mama. Anyway, so yeah, so it's this, right? This is what you think your infrastructure looks like, but it's not chaos. It's stories. Each each machine in your network has a story behind it. Why it got that IP host name? Why it has that specific configuration? Why it's that specific way? Right. So this is possible outcomes. Thank you. Right. So. These things have possible outcomes, and depending on the technology you choose higher up in the stack is how things will end at the end for you. True or false? Am I talking bullshit? If I do, raise your hand. <laughs> this is an interactive session, so if you want to stop me and ask a question or opinion, I, I will stop and ask you the same question back. Um, so yeah, so the, the idea is not to be prescriptive, right? We're not going to say these things and these things need to have these kinds of values. It's, it doesn't work that way, right? It's a rule set. We have to make decisions in our infrastructure that guides us towards a specific goal. It's like, listen, we can't do things this way because, yeah. Now, if you work with a rule set, then you might be familiar of other stuff that uses rule sets. Like, most games use rule sets. If you go play the board games outside there, if nobody uses the same rules, then it's not fun anymore, right? It should be fun. Games should be fun to play. It's like Dungeons and Dragons, right? There's a rule set, but one thing is certain. Always certain when you choose, a, well, when you make multiple choices in IT that it's gonna hurt, <laughs> right? Each decision you're gonna make is gonna have a knock-on effect. So we at Obsidian have 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 an interesting history, right? Where how old are we, Iman, at the back? 23 years old. So, yeah, yeah, 23, so it's on my slides, great. I don't have notes here, so it's, it's always a surprise. So, like, we manage customers' infrastructure, and obviously, if you do something for 23 years, you kind of get into a groove, I don't know. You've heard of automation, yeah, it's a fax machine. Right, so <laughs> yeah, that, uh, you can you can probably think about it in that depth. So we have legacy, right? You think you have legacy? You think you have an old app running on your network? We we have legacy, right? So um, and we we try and try and mitigate our risks by trying to normalize the dependencies and the legacy that we have. And by this, we use a certain set amount of tools that we just want to use, right? So. In the beginning, we started using Puppet. Uh, Puppet, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Puppet. Anyway, um, we looked at Ansible, but seriously, who does that? Sorry, where's the guy? Where's the guy? <laughs> 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 right. So we did look at Ansible. I'm not gonna bash YAML. I will. I will bash YAML because we we don't think it's great for configs. Why? Because we're operations guys. We're not necessarily devs. So we don't like structured text. Because, yeah, structured text, right? I'm sure you can run a linter against it to make it nice and make it work, but why must I do a linter when I can write the bash script that can fix something, right? Without needing to be formatted in a perfect way. So, the thing is with YAML is that, yeah, now that's the kind of thinking that leads to a maze like YAML. 
right? So, and then everybody thinks YAML, 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 YAML. But YAML doesn't solve everything, right? It doesn't. YAML, YAML, yeah. Another one. <laughs> so the thing is that, that, so we started looking at different tools. Um, we tried to think about how we can try and, <laughs> yeah, I don't wanna, yeah, I'm not gonna say it. That's the best way. So, so the current Linux versions that we support is 18 versions on three architectures. You think you have scope, okay. Anyway, so that's a little list of the Linux distributions that we work with. Um, so the oldest on that is up to 10.04. So the last, I think, which was, we had a Fedora 4.3 machine up to like two years ago or something, or a year ago, a year ago, a Fedora 4.3 machine. Try patch that thing, man. <laughs> Let's see if that, that gives you a sleepless night or what. So yeah, so, and the, the fifth, yeah, this is 50% of what we manage on with our automation tools. So th there's other stuff that we still need to add to our automation infrastructure. We use SSH to configure our machines, much like Ansible. So this is our current SSH config with the amount of lines in that thing, 2,221. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff that we manage through, through SSH and stuff that, that's in there. Now obviously there's some comments in there, but yeah, it's, we have legacy and we need to, to manage things. So we needed something that was a bit more forgiving, not like Ansible. Um, Ansible, yeah. <laughs> You can use it and then ask for forgiveness later. Um, so, um, so yeah, and we had a strong infrastructure background, but not necessarily a strong programming background, which makes um, even Ansible a bit tricky for our guys. Now, I'm not dissing anybody who uses Ansible. Ansible is definitely a great tool to use for certain things. For deployments and stuff like that, that's, it's a great tool, right? But we didn't need a product, we needed a framework. So, and now we're going to start with my, my presentation, so sorry about that. So, yeah, so one of the stuff that we wanted to do was do infrastructure as code, but we needed to test everything. And obviously, if we have to test against all the specific distributions, things can get very, very heavy. And there is no real prescribed testing framework within Ansible. Now, I know you guys have Molecule, and Red Hat has done good work of trying to incorporate Molecule into your main testing stuff, but we wanted uh, to use something a bit more robust, right? So and we, we like to test everything on everything, right? So if you don't understand Afrikaans, too bad. <laughs> right, so, um, so we needed to start writing tests for infrastructure. So um, how did we do this? So this is pretty much how our pipeline looks at the moment. <laughs> we just test, 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 test to make stuff work. And some of the tools that we use is a lot of tools from the Chef framework. Um, now I call it a framework because it's not necessarily just the tools. So one of the tools in this specific set of collection of stuff is a thing called Kitchen. Now Kitchen gives you the ability to provision and make machines on the fly using different virtualizers. So you can have a kitchen file. Here's a nice kitchen file. Oh, cool. The contrast, right? <laughs> Cool, so this is, a, this is the example of a kitchen file, and you can use different virtualizers at the top with uh, Vagrant, Docker, or Windows, or DigitalOcean, or AWS, or Google Compute, or whatever. And you can point this kitchen to whatever environment you want to use. Now, kitchen isn't just limited to Chef. Whoa, open source, right? So, so you can use it with Puppet, Salt, Stack. If, who uses Salt Stack? Sorry, Yuan. Um, <laughs> Johan works for Susan. It's a mandatory answer. And someone else, do you like using salt stack? The hand over here? Good, good, we need to talk. We need to connect. <laughs> over <a> cup. <laughs> cool, so, so yeah, you can use any type of configuration management tool, and you can point it to any type of OS. And then obviously you can have your specific nice tests here at the bottom, either using stuff like server stack, or R spec or cucumber or inspec. And inspec is such a. Do you guys know inspec? Anybody work with inspec? Morkel? Yay. No check is any post, buddy. Anyway, okay. So here is a, here's a basic configuration file of how, how we use Kitchen. Now, obviously, this is the, just two platforms that we're spinning up there, but you can obviously say Ubuntu 1604 or whatever. And that's a legitimate working configuration file. In Apple. In YAML. <laughs> okay, in YAML. Oh, no. Okay, in YAML. Right, so it's YAML. Right, so, and 
it just works and this spins these things up and you have a specific here that at the bottom of the test suites, it spins up the specific client and there you spin up your specific recipe and then at the bottom you can have a specific test where you can have compliance and then run to see if these recipes of configuration stuff you've done on the machine is actually valid and you have a nice beautiful checklist of things that you, that you can do. So, oh this is actually our code, nice, sharp. So this is a basic test of one of our stuff that we do. Um, we have a compliance suite here at the bottom. We use Vagrant, and some certain stances Vagrant is faster, but now with this bloody thing called Meltdown and Spectre, my life is ruined because uh, I just, we just took a massive knock of, of performance of compute and virtualization. So we've, we've switched to Docker now for this. And I will show you an example of exactly how we run these tests with Docker. So this is a poofy MacBook Pro. It's not the model name. Um, it's also not the color. Uh, so it's, um, it's just a normal i5 with 8 gigs of RAM. And I, I can do these similar tests where I spin up each of these machines and test our code basically in a space of like five to six minutes. And that just like revolutionizes everything because we need to spin up these vanilla machines and test our code against everything to make sure that it works. And um, yeah, I, I can do a demo. Maybe, maybe even some days. Let's quickly put this in now. Obviously because we're, how the hell does that work? It's lost my window. Oh, full screen mode. So, all right. I'm using Z shell with bookmarks. Don't judge me. Uh, export. So I'm not gonna spin it up in AWS. I tried to do that yesterday. My heart was broken. SCP was slow. And then all you need to do is basically just say, Okay, so I could just spin up these little beautiful things. Yeah, these are, this is production. <laughs> so I'm not uploading anything. There's no QA or Git merges that you have to approve. I'm just looking at my team. So yeah, we're quickly spinning up a few machines. This is etching into it. It's looking pretty, pretty cool. Lacquer, lacquer. Now, I can alt tab and continue with the presentation that you don't have to look. look Jeez, buddy, what about drink, eh? <laughs> I want that, too. <laughs> anyway, so running curl, it's quickly installing the chef into the container and then running the tests, and then we're gonna have some beautiful output. So we just see here at the top. Yeah, I'm getting some downloads, not very fast. Uh, make a second. Oh, All right, it's doing its magic, I'm going back here. Cool. Yeah, install loading. Cool, so that's how we do our testing. Well, obviously I'm not using Vagrant. Any of you guys used Vagrant before? I'm sure some of you have used Vagrant before. Thanks again, it's very different. Okay, cool. We can talk about that too, because it's such a great tool, right? So here's an example using, using Kitchen with Ansible, because I, I know that you guys love these things. This is also a working solution. Same here uh, as the previous thing, Basically, the only difference between the two is the provisioner. Obviously, Chef is a lot more complex than Ansible. Um, that's a joke. Um, you have to specify a bit more, more attributes here with, with Ansible. Obviously, a specific playbook that you want to trigger as well, um, and where your role's path is, and, and exactly what you want to do. And here, I'm just basically spinning up one machine and then forwarding some SSH stuff. Oh, yeah, and then here's my integration test at the bottom. But yeah, these examples are available. If you want it, just mail me. I'll send you some examples of how to integrate everything. Um, it's, it's really, really simple. All you need to do is install the Vagrant uh, uh, executable and install, um, what else do you need to install? Yeah, the, the Chef DK, which is a dev or a RPM or an EXE or an MSI package or whatever. So yeah, that's it. So this brings you up to the next tool called Inspec. Inspect is also now and you say, like, oh, you know, your brand, your virtual, like your brand signaling, what's it called? I don't know, I'm not doing that. But uh, Inspect is compliance as code. The cool thing about uh, Inspect is that Vocal is presenting a session. Vocal, raise your hand. <laughs> the session just 
of the mind about InSpec. Um, InSpec is great. Now he's not really presenting a session, I'm just putting him on the spot. Now InSpec is this idea of writing a test for your infrastructure to make sure that something is supposed to be in a way or a state that it's supposed to be. Mark Ditson, is that the right way of putting it? So here's an example of how we check to see if the package of bind utils is installed on something like Debian or a Red Hat based family machine. Now obviously, because of consistency on Linux, the names are the same, right? Always the same. So no, it's not. So here in the Debian example, um, we describe a specific tool called DNS utils and then it should be installed and stuff that's in the Red Hat family should actually have bind utils for that specific um, this was stuff like tool, uh, tools like dig and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different other examples. This might be a very complicated example to look at. So here's another one that could be a bit easier to understand. Uh, read it and think what this thing is supposed to do, <laughs> right? Okay, so it's basically trying to describe a specific port, port 22, it should be listening. That's a normal SSH test to see if is this H is listening on that specifically. So it's very cool. So other cool thing that you can do in spec is you can test cloud environments. So you can run this framework against AWS or Google Compute or Azure, and you can ch check whether a specific, and even the DevOps days, and all stuff, so I should change that. But anyway, uh, if I run a specific instance, it says it should be running, the image ID should be that, my SSH key, that's on that machine should be that, the instance type should be that size, and so on. And there I'm checking a, a specific security group in AWS as well. So in this way, you can also automate your tests against your cloud infrastructure because, hell, if some admin or somebody just adds an additional port or an additional route to something and something breaks, you want to be aware that something like this has happened. So you want to have consistent tests against your cloud infrastructure to say that things are working in a specific way. So other friends, uh, Vagrant and Terraform. Who had used Terraform before? Yola? Damn it. It's the coolest thing that you'll learn, learn about today, except Kitchen, right? Terraform, infrastructure as code. I wonder if there's a screenshot. Okay, so our stuff is still curling because obviously internet. I should have used the, the other internet stuff. Okay, so let's just quickly go here. Let me quickly show you Vagrant. Ah, oh, Terraform. So Terraform. Just here. Glad you didn't see my browser history. I'm also very glad about that. Anyway, cool. So full screen on a Mac, that's a great idea. All right, cool. Just wanna see my cursor. Cool, so the cool thing about, about Terraform is, is I don't know who heard if you've heard of these major cloud providers. <laughs> They're pretty, yeah, right? Terraform is a unified computing language, an abstraction language that you can speak to all these different cloud environments to to provision resources. So, I don't know, who's used AWS here before? Raise your hands. Or Google Compute? Anybody? So, on the, or Azure? At least one hand for Azure. Oh. It's okay, it's okay. This is a safe space. Um, so, uh, yeah, so to provision a specific, let's go here to, these are all the things that you can address in the, with using Terraform, speaking different things. So you can create snapshots, you can create disks, you can create anything. So I'm looking for an easy to instance. So let it my scene, oh, there's one. So to prove, oh, I could actually just show you my code. Even better. I use VS Studio Code, so you can judge me now, and we'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll forgive you. Forgive you. So let me just quickly get that example. Um, Who's a Vim user here? Good, good, no judgment. Emacs, don't raise your hand. <laughs> uh, yeah, not that I will judge you intentionally. Okay, cool, sorry, you don't see what I see, but I will show you. 
who did the password? Yeah, you'll see my passwords in AWS credentials, right? Don't use it. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. So, so here, here's a basic example of provisioning an instance, right? So, I'm addressing a specific resource. I want to have an AWS instance. I want the Ubuntu. Um, here I am looking for a specific uh, Ubuntu 1604 image here. You can address, oh, there it is. <laughs> Never leave your variable in the file. And then basically what needs to happen after the specific machine gets provisioned. But technically, this is the code to provision a machine in AWS. Very basic, very basic. One of my favorites is, who uses DigitalOcean? Anybody, okay. Okay, we love DigitalOcean where we come from. Why? Because they're so damn cheap. So, ooh. <coughs> they're, they're, they're provision a specific instance, right? Resource, DigitalOcean, droplet, New York City, sent away seven, um, give it to me that name, and it's actually provisioning two nodes, two gig nodes with that SSH key. That is Terraform code that you speak directly to the API, and it just works like a bomb. So I can show you Google Compute. I think I have a credentials file there. Lucky, lucky. Google Compute's the same. That's a startup script, but yeah, basically here I'm provisioning a specific resource here at the top. I'm tagging it, US Central, that's the resource. Right, so it's very elegant and easy um, to understand. And most of these uh, editors, modern editors, edit, modern, Visual Studio Code, Atom, um, things like that, things that uses Electron, that, that stuff that eats your RAM, that thing. Um, they have auto-completion for stuff like Terraform and stuff like that, so you can quickly build uh, resources. I can show you how to provision a machine on, on Azure. No, 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 read one, it says no. no. It's fine, but you can do that as well. So here's examples for Linode. OpenStack and for Packet and for the Wingu. Wingu is our local OpenStack open source cloud provider. The guys are great, they're in Midran, very nice guys. Offer the same pricing as AWS and Azure, but everything is in our country on our Terraco background. It's very nice, very nice, but they run OpenStack, full OpenStack with API, and obviously my check is in the post for pitching them. So yeah, if you want this repo, I'll give it to you. Um, just a disclaimer, I tried to use the Ali Cloud, um, the Amazon for, for China. <laughs> don't. <laughs> I don't want to give them my residency address and tax certificate and things like that, so they can my account. Um, but yeah, these are pretty much like provisioning basic Docker nodes in, in these environments. And I'm more than happy or willing to share this for you, with you. So yeah, so. Terraform is great. Um, also, another thing that I wanted to show you was that Terraform also supports multiple other stuff. So there's a lot of uh, providers. I don't know if you've recognized some of these names, right? But you can do basically Terraform with anything. <laughs> you can speak to anything, creating any type of resource. They support Grafana, Asinga2, Kubernetes, MySQL, Nomad, any other tool that you might have come across. Cobbler, DigitalOcean, they also have uh, that. Hetzner Cloud is here as well. Some of you guys might be running on Hetzner Cloud. Power DNS Rancher, there's like the list goes on and on and on with stuff that you can provision in the cloud using stuff like that, uh, like there. Cool. So, let's see what else is there. Hopefully there's gonna be enough time for questions, my favorite. So our pipeline, yeah. Our pipeline is that we basically, when we, uh, who's heard of Git? <laughs> Git, anybody? Git with a program. My, my best pun of the day. So our pipeline works like this. We commit, and then basically we permit the specific branch to master, and then we have a build process that kicks off. Now, um, we use a tool called Bamboo from Atlassian, um, but you can use something like Jenkins or GitHub's Runner or whatever. And we use our specific kitchen at the back end to spin up these VMs and then run our code against them, the specific branch, and then see if everything was successfully triggered or, or everything uh, has built correctly. 
And then based on that, we ship that code and obviously off to our chef server that distributes it to our multiple automation environments. But the most important thing is that we've learned is that, that ultimately we came to these specific technology decisions, but we stayed there for, for the community because the community around these tools are the things that actually keep you there. It's no use the things technology is superior, but there isn't other users that will come and give you a new mindset change or like give you new, new ideas on how to distribute a specific code or build your code in a specific way. So the most important thing that, that I want you guys to do now, 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 after now, um, is share ideas, right? Because that's the, that's the most, that's the reason why you're here. If you don't want to learn something, then you could have just stayed home and read, read it, or upvoted something on Reddit. Not Reddit, Reddit. In the old days we used to have slash dot, but that's ruined now. So yeah, but yeah, the ultimate thing is to, to share ideas. And um, I, I wanna invite you guys to like just target me here or there at the back of our stand. Just come and talk to me about ideas that you have, and I'll tell you you're dumb or something. And it will be free, I won't charge you. So yeah, or you can show me a few things that you guys are doing and then we can, we can work on that. But the idea is that we share ideas because as soon as you like, live in a silo and you don't share your ideas, you, you kind of become like, it becomes like an echo chamber. The idea with the, the problem with the, with the echo chamber is that you only hear your own ideas. So I don't know if I'm talking bullshit, but you haven't pulled me out yet, so maybe that's a good idea. Cool, so any questions? Anything. I'm married. I have three children. My home loan's 12 years paid off. Yes. Question. Okay, so three kids. What? Um, no, but I'll tell you how they made, but not here. Okay, no. no <laughs> yeah. Well, I have four kids, so. Anyways. Good luck. I like having kids. Anyways, um, what I do want to know is um, the infrastructure as a code thing. How many clients in South Africa is actually making use uh, that you deal with? With uh, uh, the, you've mentioned a local provider and AWS. Is it actually being used in production? Oh um, yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. What would be a big well, okay? Then, cost-wise, does it actually work out cheaper than just getting a shitload of business servers and all your own? Massive rack at Terraco or whatever. I don't um, know. I don't know. Do you trust ESCOM? Oh, did I say something wrong? <laughs> so um, that, that's that's obviously things to consider. It's like stuff. Do you consider our bandwidth being stable enough to run production workloads? Yes, I think I think it's better than it was. But obviously, <laughs> the cool thing about having something in in a cloud or a specific environment is it's on. It didn't work. It's off. It didn't work in the US availability zone. It's on, it's off, it's now in the EU. And that's the cool thing with infrastructure as code, is like you can move and shift your workloads without having major impact. Obviously you have to design your stuff to work like that, but because you can quickly break down and build up somewhere else, there's no real financial investment that you need just at the end of the month when you have to pay that credit card bill. So I don't know if that answers your question. But obviously there's some workloads that you want to run locally. So if you want to like do some big data stuff, it's obviously going to not make sense to ship off, <laughs> upload all your code when you can just have the compute locally. But I don't know, maybe those things will change. Another question? Come on, Yala. What is your most challenging thing that you have with Docker right now? <laughs> Hello? Yes. Wow. Okay. No, we've just started with it actually now. So yes. we're still learning how it works, but we've deployed now one product to a client with it. Okay. And no, we don't yet have issues. Not but, yet. But I guess it's still coming. Okay. Okay. Do you need any help with Docker? Maybe we will soon, but not yet. No, I'm not pitching our services because there's a room full of experts here that's already used Docker. <laughs> so, so yeah, this guy needs help with Docker. Get him, his name is, what's your name? His name is Christian. Christian needs help with Docker. Who else has a technology challenge that needs to get it sorted today? Or have an answer on something? Like running BTRFS in production? <laughs> Nobody does that. Um, is there anybody running BTRFS in production? Come to the front. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, uh, yes, okay. Anything else? ZFS and production, anybody? On Solaris? What? Oh. They don't make that anymore, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, great. Thanks for your time. Uh, no, oh, wait! A question! Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for what? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, Cole, basically, it's, it's actually just a question more for your company. Okay. So, you guys support, and I noticed. Uh, some of the distros that you're supporting obviously have reached end of life. Yes. Do you guys uh, backport any of the newer security no, stuff? Never, never, never. Why? Because then that becomes a fight with the vendor. So we've gone like bolder, like here's a new four kernel for your Fedora 4 2 machine. That's probably it's probably possible, but yeah, I don't. Uh, if I want to consider my career path in the future, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> because yeah, that's that's. Firstly, obviously, you should see the value in having something like a Red Hat subscription or something like that. Or you should actually be an be a adult and upgrade your machines. Yeah, you see the problem that we said is that uh, yes. you, you battle with bend a lot. Okay. Yes. So running certain production systems, you know, the, the old adage of if it's not broken, don't try and fix it. Don't patch it. Exactly. Yes. So, uh, and I mean, I can give you our specific use case here is that we're running Oracle EBS, but it is an older version. Okay, they do not support that version on either CentOS 6 or 7. Mm -hmm. uh, so we actually, uh, or Red Hat 6 or 7. So we run uh, RHEL 511. Yes. And uh, one of the things that we now battle with is SSH, it's a big one. Yes. Uh, so version 1 or 2 or whatever. Well, the thing is, is that now the ciphers on the newer machines, okay. uh, so it's impossible to SSH out of that box. It sounds like a perfect, perfectly yeah. secure so now, machine. You know, it's, a, it's a scenario <laughs> where. Specific packages, if they could be updated, uh, you'd have to go source and yeah. go through the whole I chain. think I think that's why oh, identifying if there's any vendors here in the back. Um, yeah, you see the thing is that probably the, the vendor will tell you, listen, it's time to pay that extra subscription, that gold mega one that, that, that makes your dreams come true and your your ex-wife disappear. That one, right? But the thing is that, like most things, and the ex-wife, it costs a lot of money. And a lot of organizations don't necessarily want to spend that. So the thing is that, yeah, there's no easy answer. I, I would say, bite the bullet and do it. Yeah, look, uh, we are, effectively, we are biting the bullet, but uh, the, uh, the wheels of commerce don't always move as fast as what we'd like them to. So. Really? Uh, See, the change is yeah, uh, anyway. six months in the making, but until such time, uh, you're basically now having to apply specific firewall rules and yeah. access lists and things to try and prevent people from even accessing the box, whether it be legitimate or otherwise. Yeah, let's have a conversation offline. Cool. Thank you, guys. You've been great.